2022. Monza, the Dutchman Nick de Vries is deputizing for Alex Albon and he's setting the world alight, scoring ninth on debut in a Williams that seemed allergic to scoring points and impressing everyone who bared eyes upon him. He was named driver of the day, he was the talk of the town, and he caught the eye of people up and down the paddock, not least that of Dr. Helmut Marco, the head of the Red Bull Driver Development Program. He had a seat vacant for 2023 and, with his apparent disdain for hiring his own drivers, he signed Nick de Vries to drive for Scuderia Alfa Tauri come next season. It was a moment of euphoria and it seemed a long time coming. For a million years he'd either been in a Formula 1 academy or in an actual Formula 1 car, but now he'd actually be racing full time in it. Finally, after all these years, it seems that destiny has arrived and things surely can only get better. Yeah, given I made this video and this prediction on Nick DeVries, I think I ought to owe the whole world a favor here and shut my mouth for once. In the span of just 10 months, Nick DeVries went from being a commodity and the words on everyone's lips to one of the biggest busts in Formula 1 history. He was fired in 10. 10 freaking races! Some say it wasn't deserved. Others say it was. Some say he wasn't given enough time. Others, however, say that's just part of the game. But while on the surface of things this may look rancid as hell, there is more to this than meets the eye. Something that likely has wider ramifications for the whole Red Bull program. So what are they? What can we expect from this? And really, what the hell happened to Nick De Vries? <laughs> So we're going to have a brief run through of his less than half year year at Alpha Tauri and just keep a mental note of all of this and about whether or not his inevitable demise was necessarily fair. So heading into the season, it was known that De Vries would be heading into the not so competitive unit of Alpha Tauri. What we didn't know was how not so competitive they would be. Some teams like to sport throwback liveries to commemorate their histories. This year for Alpha Tauri, however, it appears that their throwback came in the form of pace, as an homage to their Minardi days. If it wasn't the slowest car on the grid, it was bloody close to actually being it. But for De Vries, as long as he can keep within earshot of his teammate Yuki Tsunoda, then that's about all he could do. And under the watchful eye of Dr. Helmut Marco, that would be enough. Must be said, however, his first race for the team in the season opener in Bahrain wasn't the greatest of starts, qualifying nearly 8 tenths slow than his teammate and finishing a while behind him in the race. In fact, he was slower than him for the whole weekend and the overall performance can best be described as underwhelming. The second round in Saudi Arabia gave hope that uh, maybe he'll find his feet soon enough. Yeah, he qualified behind Sonoda again, but this time he was only a couple of tenths away. Impressive too, given his power unit called in sick during the third practice session. Spinning and qualifying didn't make him look like a million bucks though, and him being double stacked behind Yuki in the pit stops threw him even further down the order, and thereafter struggled to maintain position on the racetrack. So once again, he finished behind Yuki and nowhere near the points. The next race in Melbourne boasted some potential potentially good returns. He made it into Q2 for the first time that year, and he was running closer to his teammate's pace. But during the race, he struggled again. Damage early on in the race affected the car's performance, and when opportunity beckoned with the lap 56 plane crash, he was yeeted into the sandbox by a deliberately obtuse American. Still, at least it wasn't his fault. The crash in the next race in Baku was, twice in fact, and in Miami, he cannoned into the back of Lando Norris on the opening lap. The silver lining of that weekend being that, finally, he had beaten Yuki in qualifying. Monaco was a relatively lukewarm affair. Nothing bad, but nothing astounding either. And by now, rumors began to circulate that Marco was developing buyer's remorse on De Vries. Sure, he performed a little better come Spain, out qualifying Yuki again, but he did spin 11 million times and then got decimated by Yuki in the race. Montreal, he was slower than Yuki again. And in the race, he shepherded Kevin Magnussen down the escape road as both drivers exchanged stories about how their respective paymasters now wanted to kill one another. The pressure was Mounting, with some journalists saying that De Vries would need a miracle to retain his seat for the remainder of the year. How did he respond to these rumors? By qualifying last in Austria. I wouldn't call that ideal. Sure, he did finish ahead of his teammate in that race, but those watching the race were under no illusion as to who was the faster of the two drivers that weekend. Where they placed at the end was purely circumstantial. By now, the European season was well underway, and it was expected that, with all these tracks known to him very well, and previous testing experience in Formula 1 machinery, that De Vries would start to make good on his hype, but it just wasn't happening. By now, people were looking at Liam Lawson, and for very good reason.
Now that he was in a championship where reliability wasn't the be-all and end-all of where you end up, he was proving his worth in the deceptively competitive and extremely awesome Super Formula Championship in Japan. In the opening race at Fuji, he became the first rookie to win on debut since Mark Shura back in 1978. He won again in Autopolis in a drive that almost no one could quite believe. I still have no idea how he won that race. He didn't even hold off those on newer tyres, he just drove away. Now, am I hyping him up based on his passport? Eh, maybe. But everyone who was watching his progress over in Japan was astounded and apparently exceeded the expectations set before him by the Red Bull Academy, all virtually crying out for his birth on the Formula 1 grid. And with Ayuma Uwasa being extremely fast in Formula 2, Alex Pillow making everyone look like a joke in IndyCar, and a wealth of other Red Bull juniors making their way through the ranks, this put an insane amount of pressure on Nick DeFries. His quest to improve his standing in the 10th round at Silverstone wasn't helped by news that AlphaTauri had somehow become slower than it was at the start of the season. But he still did have a teammate to compete against, so he didn't look like a million bucks when he was trailing half a second behind in qualifying. Throughout the weekend, Marco was making snide comments toward De Vries via the media. They also made mention about how they were closely monitoring Daniel Ricciardo's performance in the tyre test after the week was done. It appeared that, despite the ultimatum set up for De Vries, the Sith Lord of the Formula 1 paddock had already made his mind up. De Vries felt that he had a decent race. Despite an undisclosed issue with the car toward the end, he personally felt that his performance was decent. Just days after the race, rumours started to run rampant that Nick had indeed lost his seat. Normally, when there's this much smoke, there's fire. And sure enough, just hours later, the penny dropped. Or rather, he was dropped. After only 10 races, Nick de Vries went from being one of the more highly touted drivers in the world to one of the biggest busts in Formula 1 history. So much promise surrounding him heading into the season, and now his F1 career was over before it really had a chance to begin. So knowing the basic gist of his performance in those 10 races, was his firing justified? Some of you will, understandably, say yes. I, however, say no. Holy crap, no way. No. Even if you have someone like Nick DeFleez, who comes in with a million years of junior formula racing experience, which he did, a million miles worth of testing in F1 machinery like he did, a hell of a lot of hype generated from one good performance against an anemic Canadian like he did, 10 races is just not enough time. If he were to be dropped at the end of the year after a season of bad results, that's one thing. And honestly, he likely was not going to improve to the level that they wanted anyway. But they didn't even extend the courtesy of waiting until the summer break before giving him the boot. Mistakes, as well as underperformance on the track and in the sim, yes, the freaking simulator, was enough to give Marco cold feet. And then when Ricardo apparently did very well in a tyre test mere days later, that was enough for the Austrian to pick up the phone and fire the Dutchman. While the test was still going on, it must be set. And now this is where I'm going to talk about Dr. Helmut Marco a little bit. Because yes, he had a good run of a motor racing career, which includes winning the 24 hour of Le Mans. Whatever we think of him, he has accomplished more as a driver than most of us would ever hope to do. And he did a good job managing fantastic talent such as Karl Vandlinger and Gerhard Berger. And let us not forget that under his watch, Red Bull fostered in the likes of Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo, Pierre Gasly, and the team of Carlos Sainz and Max Verstappen back in 2015. But I want to put a lot of emphasis on this particular sequence of events, because it has been a complete cluster he hired a driver based off of a one-off performance in 2022, ignoring his junior drivers who he thought weren't ready for Formula 1. Yeah, sure. Liam Lawson and Ayuma Owasa were not ready for Formula 1. Right, gotcha. But you do get the sense, when you look at his comments, that he bases his opinions on his drivers based on their Wikipedia articles. On that basis, I know a few F1 YouTubers that could do your job for you, mate. He publicly lambusted De Vries mere weeks into his tenure at AlphaTauri. Five or six rounds in, there was already talks of replacing him. Some names were thrown around, but it did seem to be whoever was the talk of the town that particular week, when Colton Herta was showing off the bucket loads of natural talent that he does have. Marco got goosebumps pimples and thought that maybe he should get a look in for the Alpha Tauri seat. And then when Alex Pelot started to win 89,000 races over in IndyCar, Marco took a liking and proclaimed that maybe he should be destined for the Alpha Tauri seat. Yeah, sure. But hey, lest we forget the last time that Marco hired a driver from IndyCar. Drivers around the world lamented how unfair this was. Some even questioning the process of hiring the drivers. Like, what does it say about them when all the drivers crumple under pressure and fall out of the game mere months into the campaign? I can talk endlessly about the constant recycling 
of the drivers throughout the system, all those failed experiments and the like. And DeVries seems to be yet another spoke on the wheel in that respect, replaced by a former Red Bull Jr. Not the first time that Marco has ever done that. And now he's reapplying pressure to Yuki Tsunoda. But Yuki is not the driver who should really be worried. It's Checo. You think I'm on acid? Again? Well, no. See, Honey Badger isn't the type of dude who'll be content with a backmarker's car. He knows how good he is. He knows he can win races. So he expects to be in a car that he can win races with. Now, he's not going to get that with an Alpha Tauri, unless he's at Monza and God bestows a curse on the rest of the field. But what if this isn't the end game for him? What if this is an assessment of both he and Perez? Could they be seeing if Ricardo still has it? A sort of tryout, especially if Checo keeps up his habit of getting knocked out in Q1 in a car designed by Adrian Newey. Come to think of it, I know someone who recruited in a very similar way. There's only one spot open right now, so we're gonna have tryouts. So, to summarize, they fired a driver who they felt underperformed only 10 races into his full-time career. They then hired a driver who had a horrible 2022 to take his place. He's there to help develop the car, but also, theoretically, they're on assessment to see whether or not he's still got it. Whether or not he'd be able to replace Sergio Perez in the Red Bull team. But it might not even be next year. It might be 2025. And by that time, plans may change. After all, Marco does have the temperament of a cat in a bath. All the while, he's still putting pressure on Yuki Tsunoda and claiming publicly that he doesn't feel that any of the Red Bull juniors that he is mentoring are good enough for Formula 1. Talents are being butchered left, right and centre and all the while, he's acting confused whenever one of his knee-jerk reactions doesn't pay off for him. Perhaps, Dr. Helmut Marco, if you really want to fire someone for underperforming, look in the mirror.